what we'll do, we'll talk about, to start with, um, I'll just call it a holistic multidimensional model. I'm keeping it really broad because it'll relate to the things we do physically. And in medicine, as we know nowadays, it's a big focus on the physical body. But increasingly, um, I think it, pretty well most practitioners will admit that the psychological has a huge impact on the physical and what's going on in people's personal lives impacts on the physical as well. And the ability to recover as well. Because if there's lots of complications of what's going on in the body, the body's the battleground for what's happening on other levels of being. So if someone's going through a, a state where they're working on their emotional body, that's where they're, they're dwelling most of the time. The conflicts emotionally and learning how to handle that energy will manifest in the physical body. Yeah? And so if you're aware of that, you can, ta you can actually just be aware of that while you're treating. You don't even have to necessarily do anything extra except be aware of it. And being aware of it makes a difference on what's happening. And that's one of the things I ask the participants in my study. Do you think being aware of those levels makes a difference on your treatment? And they all said yes. It's almost like if you're massaging the body and you know there's an emotional component. When you think about the body physically in your massage, it feels tight. But when you think about the emotional, it makes it even worse. Anything that makes the problem worse, you know, is part of the picture. And so common, commonly people say, but how do you treat that? And you actually, by just being aware of it, is enough to, tre to treat it. It's almost like you're, instead of massaging the body, you're massaging the, the emotions in the body together. Mm -hmm. Because it's in your awareness, it's in, you're connecting with it. And that's really as easy as it gets. But for people who don't grasp the mental side, the awareness side, it's a bit of a leap. It's sort of like, because this, you can get so fixed on a structure that nothing else exists. And you see that in our field yes, all no. the time. <laughs> it's sad, but it's, it happens. It's sad, but true. <laughs> so that's the idea. So we want to open that up um, in a really rational way so that it's the more rational, the more grounded it is, the more I think well, it'll get out in the world in, into medicine and whatnot. So the other thing about this is it's all about relationships. So if we understand the relationships or the relationship imbalances within our bodies, the more likely we are to recognise what we need to do to treat those relationships, to rebalance those relationships. So it's not about parts, it's not even about symptoms, it's about restoring balanced relationships. And how do you know if a relationship is balanced? Well, when you look at the function between any two things, two objects, two levels, two people, it doesn't matter what, they'll be in harmony. In other words, they're like the two sides of the seesaw are swinging in sync. In other words, they won't have any conflict with each other. They'll be in unity. They'll feel healthy. It'll function or be at ease with one another. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they're all ways of understanding how things feel right. Which is interesting because if you're treating the body and someone's got like an ankle problem, you, you probably would have noticed this. Sometimes people have pain in the ankle or the knee, but when you actually check the motion, this motion's actually okay and it all glides okay. It's a little bit asymmetrical and it's a little bit tender or stressed, but it, technically it's actually functioning. And that makes sense because the painful structures are usually overloaded, but they're doing the best they can until they tear and then it's first aid treatment. But that's not actually what we treat as practitioners. We actually treat the dysfunction in the body that are interfering with the healing process. So in a sense, instead of looking at symptoms, we should be looking at what else is happening in the rest of the system, which is interfering in recovery so that that injury can heal quicker. First aid will manage it, but what else can we do? That's the idea. That's the whole osteopathic philosophy. But nowadays, I think increasingly it's getting more focused on pain and pain management, and that's a distraction. I, I, in my experience, I find it's a distraction because the pain's usually the end effect of a whole sequence of chain of cause and effects. And you can manage pain just like you can mow the lawns, but without pulling any weeds up. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you're treating well, you've got to notice the, where the most weeds are, you start pulling them up and planting healthy seeds. So you're replacing your seeds with health, and eventually, and hey, in the area that's the most obviously in trouble, you pull a few weeds up and then you have another look at the whole picture and suddenly you're noticing something somewhere else. So after a while you get it all in order and in sync. And that's what should happen over a period of time when you start treating clients, you know, you're looking at their overall health and well-being over a period of time. 
and they should be getting healthier and more vital and more have better well-being, better ease, better function in the whole system. And then the little issues and worries just fade away because there's no reason for them to be there anymore. But obviously you have to include the mental, emotional and other levels into that. Or otherwise you can physically get a balance, but if the belief system is still holding it, it's just going to come back. So this is from, um, I'll talk a little bit about my research. I did holism and osteopathy bridging the gap between concept and practice, which I did a grounded theory study with on. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the key points that, that really anchor what I'm talking about, about relationships. So there's two, I've got, I've actually just done three articles now. I did, I've got holism and osteopathy, bridging the gap between concept and practice. That's the original research. Oh, that's the original article I wrote. And then there's another little mini review because in the original article, because it's such a big topic, holism, and you can't, when you're researching it, you can't pull it apart. That was one of the troubles I had with the reviewers because the reviewers kept saying, I think you should take this out and that out. And I say, but if I take it out, it's actually reducing holism. I have to look at the relationship between the whole That's three-quarterism. And then the bit, the, the bit, the bit, that, um, the bit that, that on the ART concept, the, the concept, the idea with the ART is that when I talk about it in a minute, that's the bit that bridges the gap between the holism and the, and the symptom. And when I was getting the, re the article reviewed, this guy said, I don't see the relevance of that. I think you should put that in something else. And I, and I had to actually go back and say, actually, that is the whole point of it. That if without that, you can't link the two extremes. So, so it's a bit like you're having to educate people about what it, what it all means before they'll accept it. But once you make put it in a rational format, people go, oh, that makes complete sense. It's just understanding how it all works. So I had to do a, a, a mini review where I put the theoretical framework of holism in healthcare. I did that, it's just a summary of the overall framework mm -hmm. as a mini review. And I've just recently done another one, which I called uh, facilitators and barriers to holistic practice, but from an osteopathic perspective. And that I thought that was important because um, when I interviewed osteopaths about what it is that made them understand what was going on better and be more holistic and be more ha happy and successful in their work, they, they said it was more going back to philosophy and principles, it was um, getting, uh, having interactions with practitioners who had a holistic framework, um, it was going through trial and error and working it out you know, by making mistakes or personal health crises, things like that were the things that made the most impact on their understanding. And they were the, also the things they said they weren't taught while they were at college. So they were the least emphasised at school. They all said they um, needed all that other stuff at, at college, all the biomedical side. But uh, that's like a framework. But they, the, other, the other stuff they got outside. And they said it would have been nice to have had some of it during the course because then they wouldn't have to spend four or five years working it out afterwards. And this is the people that want to work it out. Um, a lot of practitioners just go back to what they're taught and they don't necessarily ever ever work it out because it's their, their focus is different. So so I did another one like that just to sort of say that these are the things that are, that are done well and these are the things that students or practitioners find helps them and so there needs to be both of them in their education to some degree in order to round it all out. So what I noticed was, and this is I noticed this from both my own teaching experience, and also I noticed it from talking to other osteopaths or watching other people practice, and also with the, um, noticing students at different colleges all struggle with this idea of the difference between a holistic concept and its practical implementation. So if you look even at the research, if you go and do a, like a literature review sort of thing, the concept of holism is out there. Most, most education systems, naturopathy, osteopathy, even Cairo, and a lot of the other systems, are all based to some degree on holism, but it's not always practiced. Okay, and, and it's the same in the literature, there's this concept of holism, when you look at it, it's all there, like people use the word mind, body, spirit, they use the word, um, you know, all the different states, but when they actually practice, they just go back and just do A, B, C, D, it's like a routine sort of medical model treatment. So just because people have a concept that they're taught doesn't mean they're actually practicing what that concept is. 
people sort of just follow blindly without thinking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute and with some examples, I'll give you some examples of when I've talked to groups about holism and what happened. Um, so there seemed to be a, a difference between, and there's not a lot written on how you actually, there are some studies done that show a holistic approach seems to be helpful, particularly for people with psychological issues. And, um, and, it, and it treats people more as a whole, and it is looks at the interrelationships. But no one ever says what they actually do and how you find that. You know, so, that so there's still a bit of a gap. Um, they just do all these things, and the practitioners still, you're not sure what's going on in the practitioner's own little life, how they figure it out. Okay, so there's a gap between concept and practice. Um, and we want to try and bridge that gap so there's what people are practicing is in more aligned with what they think holism is. The other thing that's interesting is people's concept of holism um, determines a little bit how they practice, a lot. Because if someone's, and this happened even in, when I was interviewing my participants in my study, I asked them what their concept of holism was, and a lot of them had a concept which was broader than what they actually practice, and then they choose to practice what they're comfortable with within that framework. But if they didn't have a concept of holism beyond, say, the musculoskeletal system, then they tended not to explore those other elements. So if your concept of the whole person was um, just the musculoskeletal system, which nowadays is where a lot of osteopaths are getting focused, the whole is in, but on, on a musculoskeletal level, well, that's not the whole person because there's organs, there's nervous, there's organ systems, there's mind, there's emotion, lots of other levels. So the people that tended to have the broadest concept of holism, in other words, they included all those things in their awareness, were more likely to notice it in their assessment and then more likely to include it in their treatment. And they were the ones that also tended to manage more chronic and complicated health conditions. And they did it with a lot more awareness than the people who had a very limited framework. Which makes sense. If you're juggling two balls, you get good with two balls, which is like muscles and joints. And if someone throws you a third one, Suddenly you fall, it all falls down and you have to start to get that in sync and then someone throws you a fourth one. And gradually, eventually you build up an understanding of how to actually integrate and practice and treat all those different levels. And the beauty about the holistic concept is you don't have to treat those levels. Like all the participants in my study said you have to be aware of it and have a holistic assessment at least because how else are you going to know what's there to treat? Right? You don't treat based on what the books tell you. You have to actually explore the evidence in front of you on a patient. It doesn't matter what any textbook or any research says, you still have to get evidence from your assessment. So they all, they all said you need to do that, and then when you treat, that's a choice. You can choose to treat it or not treat it. Like some of them believe that the psychological is within our realm of treatment, and other people said, no, we don't deal that with that as osteopaths. They all had different views. So it's only, it's basically, it's a personal preference. But if you're aware of it, you can say, well, I know there's a psychological component present. I can send you to a counsellor. You can actually know who to send people to to deal with the elements that you're not as comfortable treating. So it makes you safe. But as you get better and better at being more holistic in theory and practice, you start including these in and become much more rounded, which is, I think, a really nice thing. So you only... You gradually improve your awareness, but you only practice what you're comfortable with. And then as you get more comfortable, you add it more in. Just like learning to juggle another ball. <laughs> Happy with that? Okay. Now, equally, equally interesting is there's this relationship between holism, holistic approach, and a biomedical approach. It's often seen as they're two different things. But really, the biomedical is not necessarily not holistic, because a lot of biomedical practitioners are. But... There's a tendency, and even in the literature, that to indicate that the, the biomedical model, people tend to practice in a more reductionist model. In other words, they're breaking things apart and treating things one at a time. A, then B, then C, then D. Whereas the holistic model looks at all those same components, but they're interrelating and treating them as an integrated unit. Which I think is like a circle, like a necklace with pearls. Each, each pearl is a component, and the, the string connecting them all, or the necklace, is actually the relationships between all those components and you're dealing with that whole interaction. Whereas the, the, the reductionist model is more looking at things like if someone's got back pain, we do this A, then B, then C. It's very linear. 
Okay, but the trouble with those is it doesn't look at relationships, it looks at paths. <laughs> and the other thing that's interesting in the literature is that there's a difference, there seems to be a difference between a modern day multimodality clinic model and a holistic model. They're two different things. Because you can have a, a multimodality clinic with psychologists, osteos, physios, medical doctors, naturopaths, psych psychologists, and they can all be treating reductionist models. Right? In other words, they're all treating bits, they're not actually interrelating. But if you have a practice that's holistic, and I've come across this before, all the practitioners have a holistic model and they all may be emphasizing different components, but they're all finding the same stuff. And they're all treating the same thing. That happened in one of my practices. We had a massage therapist, a naturopath and me, and we all assessed the same patient independently, completely different without even knowing and we all told it exactly the same thing. Even though we all treated very differently, we all told her the same thing, which, which is interesting because she thought, if everyone's telling the same thing, she better start listening. <laughs> one, of us had a, one of us had to yeah. told her, she might have just gone, oh, I don't know, but if I believe it, but because all three of us said yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, made the case. Yeah, and it's interesting because that's good into practitioner reliability. If you're coming from neutral and you're observing what's actually there, you should find the same findings. Okay, the findings only change because they're skewed by practitioners' personal perceptions. Mm -hmm. That interferes. That's why sometimes there's not good reliability because we're all looking at different things. It's like feeling different parts of the same elephant in an Indian sort of analogy. You can be feeling the ear or the hoof or the foot or the tail and think you're all on different different things, but it's all the same elephant. <laughs> Does that make sense? But if you see the whole elephant, you realise that. I'm not going to call my patient an elephant. No. <laughs> it's just, that's just an, an Indian analogy. But, so there is a little bit of a, a gap in understanding between the two extremes because a lot of people that are stuck in that rigid reductionist framework have trouble with, I think, the holistic stuff's not right. And the people on the holistic side sometimes miss the detail they need to understand what's happening symptomatically. And so they also are missing the other side of the coin. They're two sides of the same coin. So we want to look at the relationships between those so that they're very clear. Okay? And, how, and that, that's going to help practitioners to work together better for the bigger picture. So this is the core theme that I reckon is really important. If there's anything that's going to help link the two extremes, this is, in theory at least, the most important part. And that is that it's all about awareness of relationships. Now, it sounds obvious, and you can actually see it in the literature, but again, theoretically, that's true, but how do we make that practical? <laughs> now, there's two relationships that are really important. One relationship is between the tissues or the pathology or condition causing the symptoms and the symptoms themselves. Now, that's the one that tends to be more emphasized in the biomedical education and training practice which makes sense because a lot of people it's like what's causing the pain what's causing the symptoms we need to figure that out that's emphasized a lot and that's covered usually very well everyone happy with that mm -hmm. and in the students I find say we have to reproduce the symptoms but the trouble is that doesn't really help they'll tell you what to what to actually treat because the symptoms are just telling you what's stressed what's compressed or stretched too much and causing pain but why are they causing pain Okay, it's actually more important to find the other relationship, and that is the relationship between what I've called what else is going on in a whole person's life and being. So that could be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, social, environmental, could be nutritional, all these different elements and different parts of the whole person's life. Present and past, because old patterns and old traumas set the stage for present problems. If they don't cause the present problem, it forces the body to adapt, which then loads other areas up and therefore they can cause secondary problems. Uh, and therefore, the relationship between all of that and the, and the symptoms, the tissues causing symptoms themselves. Does that make sense? So you've got two links. This is the framework emphasised with the holistic side. So the holistic side's not really necessarily looking at what's causing the symptoms or the pain, but it's looking at everything else going on in a person's life contributing in some way, which is interfering with the patient's self-healing mechanisms 
and therefore slowing recovery. It's a whole different viewpoint. It's got nothing to do with the pain other than the fact that it sets it up or slows it from healing. Does that make sense? So when we get so focused on the pain stuff and teaching people about pain, that's fine, but it doesn't necessarily, practitioners are still not necessarily doing this other side of it. I think all good practitioners in any field do a bit of that. It doesn't matter what field. That's what makes them holistic practitioners. Happy with that? So if you can do both of those and explain the relationship between the two, you're going to be able to look, link up cause and effect better, and you're going to be able to explain it better to the client and to other practitioners, and it's going to also give you context for what's going on in the present. So for example, you might have uh, someone who's twisted their ankle. I'll give you a prac example. <coughs> now obviously the anterior talofibular ligament would be the ligament most likely torn, and you'll get pain and swelling, and maybe a bit of instability on stability tests. And that's fine, that causes the pain, but the treatment is usually first aid management, rest and ice and compression and all that sort of stuff. But if you think, if you do all the first aid stuff and you strap it or tape it and do all that sort of stuff, that'll, that'll, that's injury prevention and it gets you out of immediate trouble, right? But sometimes, and then if nature, if nature does its job accurately, that'll just heal over whatever time frame it takes for that to heal, one to eight weeks or something like that. But there are people that you do all that stuff and still, t um, three months later, their ankles are still swollen and puffy and stuck. And you've done all the local stuff and it still doesn't respond. So there's got to be other things going on interfering with recovery. And it could be that the pelvis is all tilted and the sacrum's blocked and the lymphatic channels are all clogged up and there's not good blood supply and drainage getting in and out. So these other problems elsewhere may not have caused the ankle problem, but they're certainly interfering with recovery. And I sort of liken that to um, if you have an emergency situation in society, let's say there's a fire in, in, down at the local shopping centre, so the fire brigade will get a call and they'll send a fire engine in. But if the well, so same with the body, the body will send you know neutrophils and macrophages. It'll set up the inflammatory process and start the healing process. But what happens if the fire truck can't get to the fire because it's got a, it hits a roadblock or a tree's down somewhere else? Okay, so it can't even get in there to do its job that it's supposed to do naturally. So when you're treating, it would make more sense, you've got to get the fire engine to the site. So you unblock the channels, you might free up the sacrum, the low back, you might free up the loop of pathways so that there's a clear channel and the body can do what it does. And then even without doing all the other symptomatic stuff, the person will heal still. Makes, makes complete sense, doesn't it? So you're looking at what else is going on interfering, which gets you to the holistic model. And you can see how it gives you context. It gives you context to understand why is that ankle not recovering in the normal time frame. Okay. So if we're aware of that, we're going to start looking for it. If we start looking for it, we're going to start finding things. 